Hi, this is John Stephen Gurney, and I'm here in my studio in my home in beautiful Brattleboro, Vermont. And this is where I create my Fuzzy Baseball series of graphic novels. And um, actually, this isn't the only place I create them, and I work in a couple different places. And before I explain all that, let me talk about my process. And my process for coming up with these stories always begins with the character sketches. So the first sketch I ever worked on was this character right here. This is a, it was just kind of a doodle and it was a little, it looks like a mouse or a rat, but it's actually a uh, honey possum, which is a, a very small Australian marsupial. And they're up at bat. And this kind of got me thinking about coming up with a book with animals playing baseball. So I came up with a bunch of other characters. And at first it was a picture book. So I had a picture book proposal called Fuzzy Baseball, which, you know, animals playing baseball. And I kept expanding it, I kept reworking it, and eventually I, um, I expanded into a graphic novel and uh, Paper Cuts, I was happy when they, they agreed to publish it. And Blossom Honey Possum, she uh, kind of evolved into this character right here. And at the beginning of the story, she's just a fan. So she's the world's biggest Fernwood Valley fuzzy fan and she roots for him and, and here's the team right here. And these players are a very uh, fun bunch of talented players. And, you know, I, I kind of had fun diving into the whole baseball aesthetic, baseball graphics. So, you know, their uniforms are based on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, and there's, there's a certain kind of type that we associate with, with baseball. And I had fun coming up with the character names. So some of these kids recognize right away. Every kid recognizes Jackie Rabbitson. A lot of kids recognize Hammy Sosa. Uh, the teachers recognize Sandy Koufax. Nobody outside Philadelphia knows Larry Boa, but you know when I when I do a school visit in Philadelphia, it's always nice to you know, get that response. So the premise is, you know, I wanted to give the kids something to root for. So you know, it's going to be kind of a good guys versus bad guys situation. So the fuzzies are the good guys, and in case there's any doubt, I, I literally say these are the good guys in the introductory spread, and this shows, you know, the kind of products they endorse and their bobbleheads. And for the, the bad guys, they would be the Rocky Ridge Red Claws. And they're kind of nasty. They're not very good sports. They're not just, they're not having fun out there. And they're, um, the products they endorse are like whoopee cushion and prune juice and barbed wire. And right here, these are the bad guys, just in case there's any doubt. So at the beginning of the story, Blossom gets tired of watching the fuzzies lose the Red Claws. So she decides Instead of complaining about it, I'm going to get really good. So she practices, she gets good baseball, she, she makes the team. So she joins the Fuzzies to see if she can make a difference. And there she is showing up at Fuzzy Field. So there's a big crowd. Everyone's very excited. It's going to be a good, good game. And um, the Fuzzies, you know, it's not don't, going so well. They're losing. It's the ninth inning. They're losing. And then Blossom discovers that the pitcher kind of moves his tail a certain way with each kind of pitch. So once she makes that discovery, she shares that with her teammates. And then they start, you know, they start getting runs on bases and stuff. A lot of twists and turns happens. Eventually, she's up to bat. You know, she ends up saving the day with a with a home run. But there's a lot of twists and turns in the way there. Um, so the second book in the series was called Ninja Baseball Blast, and this one I wanted to kind of do a morph between baseball and ninjas. So I just again starts out with sketches. I do some scare character sketches. And these became the, you know, the players in the ninja team. Good to have a little hedgehog there, Hiroshi Hedgehog. And just kind of see how silly I can get with the characters. And also, you know, tried to bring in some Japanese design feel to the baseball cards. So a little bit different than American baseball cards. So I wanted this story to be like a real mishmash of all the things that we kind of take for granted in our culture that are kind of come from Japan. So there's gonna be mystical warriors, sushi, Pokemon, Pokeball, Transformers, Kaiju. So this, in the beginning of the story, they talk about the mystical ninja baseball warriors of the past. So there's a little bit of this. And the uh, fuzzies travel to Sashimi City and they try some sushi. And there's a manga baseball book they're looking at. And inside of that book, there are these Pokemon-ish characters. And because Pokemon is a Pokeball, so in the story we have the Morpho Ball. So at some point in the game, they bring out the Morpho Ball and the crowd goes crazy, Morpho, Morpho. And the Fuzzies are kind of shocked to see what the Morpho Ball does. It actually transforms the players. And, you know, a lot of the 
Japanese TV shows I saw, every, everybody's transforming to evolving to different states. So I thought it'd be fun if the players could use the Morpher Wall to kind of uh, power up. And, you know, the fuzzies get to do it too. And things get crazier and crazier. And then Percivali Penguino becomes kind of like Godzilla. It just descends into chaos. This, this story is kind of a romp. It's kind of silly and uh, hopefully everyone will enjoy it. The third fuzzy baseball book is RBI Robots. And I thought it'd be fun if the fuzzies played a team full of robots. So I sketched out a bunch of, um, of robots. And you know, you think of a robot as a mechanical human, but in this universe, the characters are all anthropomorphic to begin with. So they're kind of like mechanical animal humans. But just to make things more complicated, when the team first arrive, they're dressed up in costumes because they're disguising the fact that they are robots. So I have to design the character and then also design what their costume is gonna look like. And I had fun with the names. Um, there's like Clunky Dent, Spark McPlier, Kirby Sprocket, uh, Krusty Fob. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of, of famous baseball players plus mechanical, um, making mechanical puns. So here they are, they are the Geartown Clankies. And here they are in their disguises when they first arrive. And hopefully the reader can kind of tell right away, like, whoa, they're, they're wearing disguises. But the kids, you know, the readers know that, but the fuzzies are a little bit slow to figure that out. But once it's revealed that they are robots, then, um, you know, Bo Grizzly is saying like, what is this, some kind of trick? What, what, what's going on here? And uh, Clunky Dent explains that the reason they're playing baseball is because their life as a robot was very dull and drab with no fun. So they, they want to play baseball to give themselves some, some excitement and just some joy. So it's not going to be a good guys versus bad guys thing because the robots are, you know, they're very nice robots. So to give the reader something to care about, I wanted to um, make it an issue as to whether Blossom is going to overcome her fear of robots. So she has this lifelong fear of robots. Um, so she doesn't have to play. And this is a little backstory. It shows how she's been tormented by robots her whole life. So she just doesn't, she wants to sit out the game. But she comes in at the end, as you might predict. So here is uh, the fourth book in the series. This is Dino Hitters. And this time I thought it'd be fun to combine dinosaurs with baseball. So the sketches, uh, you know, play to the sketches here, figure out what dinosaur would play which position. And also I gave them a very old timey kind of uniform, you know, really uh, from the past. And that's, um, and I had a lot of fun with the scale. So the, a lot of the gags stemmed from just the size differential. Like, you know, this Brachiosaurus is so big, he doesn't even fit on the page. So, and you know, the catcher's got to stand on a ladder to, to catch the ball. So here they are when they meet each other and the reader gets to see the, the, you know, the size differential, which uh, I think is kind of funny. And the pterodactyls, they're pretty good in the outfield. They're, they're good at making catching. So again, it's not a good guys versus bad guys thing. It's kind of more like, are these old vintage, are, are the, do the dinosaurs have any skills that we can learn from? But the real uh, twist of the plot is that there's this professor, his name is Professor Duterrier, and he kind of keeps interrupting the story. So the story begins with he's interviewing me, that's me right there, I'm the author, and he's interviewing me about the book. I mean, he notices some inaccuracies in the story, and then he keeps interrupting the story as it goes along to point out, you know, inaccuracies. Like right here, he kind of jumps in and he gets upset because the dinosaurs don't have feathers, and everyone knows dinosaurs have feathers. So he goes and he sticks feathers on all the, the characters. And he's so annoying that at one point T Rex just kind of gobbles him. But as the author, I make him spit him out because I don't, you know, I want this to be a nonviolent series. So I just tell Professor that he's got to. Just lighten up a little bit. And it's it's a it's a humor book. It's not a it's not a book about dinosaurs. Anyway, this is the one I'm working on right now. This will is Fuzzy Baseball Halloween, and this one should be out by fall of 23. And for this book, I wanted to um they played a team full of I wouldn't call them monsters, but kind of like outcast animals or just kind of um you know just just really oddball animals. And for the aesthetic, I really wanted to give a little bit of a nod to Ed Edward Gorey. So they're, they're kind of a little Victorian-ish. Um, um, and at some point in the story, some ghouls appear, some goblins. So this, these, these guys come in at the very end of the story. Shh, don't tell anybody. So it's not a good guys versus bad guys thing because the, 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 the players are, you know, 
most for the most part they're 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 nice. Um, but the question the reader is going to have is: Are the supernatural things real? And uh, the other question is: What does Count Fapula mean when he says he's excited about the feast after the game? So once I have the the sketches done, and then I think of some gags that are based on the sketches, and then I think of a I start imagining the story and how to string everything together. And then I, as a Word document, I just type out the story and I kind of figure out at this point what's going to go on what page. Um, so I'm thinking about how the pages look. I'm thinking about how the spreads look. So I, I just thumbnail out the story onto these. Each one of these rectangles represents a spread. And um, I wouldn't show this to an editor because it, it's kind of impossible for anybody to, to read this besides me. But if you look at the lower left, there's pages. Uh, 20 and 21. So then I'll do a tight sketch. No, I say this is still a, a rough sketch, a, a, a rough sketch. And then, but I'll put the, I'll put the type on just to make sure the type fits in the space. And then I refine the sketch and then I'll, I'll do the, the artwork in black and white. So I use a pencil and gray watercolor and I render everything traditionally. And then I scan it. And then on the computer, I add color and I add texture. And then I add the graphics for the uniforms. I add that uh, on the computer as well. And then I will, the final thing is to add the, the type in the, the type bubbles, balloons, whatever they are. So that's the whole process of how I, I create the illustrations for the, for the stories. So I love working up here and I love working at this desk because this desk is also a light table. An important part of my process is refining my sketches and tracing over them and, and fixing them as they go. But sometimes, because this is an attic space, it gets hot in the summer and I don't always want to run the air conditioner. So when that happens, I go downstairs to the basement where I have another studio set up. Here I am in my basement studio, and on hot summer days, this is the coolest place in the house, even though it might be a little bit of a cry for help, but it's still, it's more uncomfortable. And I have my drawing table here, and I have a light box on the table so I can refine my sketches and polish things off. And also down here, I have my oil painting set up. So if I'm doing an oil painted illustration for a chapter book cover or for a picture book like Dinosaur Train, I'll work over there. But for fuzzy baseball, the half the process is on the computer. So to, to do that part of the illustration process, I need to switch to one more spot, and that's my computer. And I probably spend at least four or five hours with each illustration on the computer. And the first thing I do is I'll add some color, and then I refine the color, I add some shading, I adjust the color of the shadows, then I add some graphics like to their uniforms, the logos. And at this point, when this is all done, then I add the text, the word balloons. And the whole goal, my whole goal in this process is even though they're digital images, I want them to kind of carry the organic feeling of the traditional. So I kind of like that's why I use pencil lines and I use actual watercolor just so it has more of a, an earthy texture, a little bit of an organic feel. So it doesn't feel like it's all done in the computer even though a large part of it is. So I live in beautiful Brattleboro, Vermont, but I teach at beautiful Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. So I work on fuzzy baseball anywhere that I have a computer or a drawing table or a light box and a pencil.